Um, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about class war games. Uh, we were formed in 2007. Um, there were a number of reasons for that. I mean, there, there were, it was a group of people, artists, academics, activists, and we were interested in the ball and situationism. Um, I'm of the punk rock generation. I was saying to someone earlier on, I discovered situationism at a Sex Pistols concert in 1976, when somebody who was just like a friend of my then partner told me that you're, a, you're into left-wing politics, which should go off and read situations. So, um, number of people, it, in England it really didn't have much of an impact in basically, obviously the, you know, the situationists were formed in the late 1950s, an avant-garde art group, they moved as into radical politics. They're basically a council communist organisation by the 1960s, particularly when Attila Katani joined, who took part in the Hungarian Revolution. I met Attila Katani once in Budapest, and he said, in 1956, we fought the communists because they were the communists, which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> uh, so they, they were a council communist organisation. Guy Debord wrote this book, uh, Society and Spectacles, in 1967. It's retrospectively seen as the, as the manifesto of the May 68 revolution. Though if you look at May 68, it says the dominant groups are actually the Trotskyists and Maoists. Uh, I think it's mainly because they, they inspired, the group of them in, uh, took part in the early protests of the Nanterre Revolution that sparked off, uh, uh, sorry, Nanterre University that sparked off the May Revolution. And then, of course, uh, they, they're also activists of theirs made the famous posters, the Ecole de Beaux Arts students. So it's, it's become associated. We discussed, but I think actually the English punk generation, after play a large part in popularising it after, because in our generation we discovered it as a sort of alternative to what the academics we were being taught. So you have to understand, by the mid-late 70s, in the university on the left, the dominant feature were people like New Left Review, Stuart Hall, uh, Gramsci, these sorts of people, and situationism was the opposite. They thought that it was all about cultural brainwashing from above, the thing about De Boer's book is it's actually a materialist critique of the growth of information and media technology. It's, he's not in, in that sense, he shares with McLuhan, though with very different politics and theory, is it's not the content in a way, it's not what's important. It's the fact that people were deprived of the means of making their own media. And that the spectacle, though obviously television is the, the example. I mean, television in the late didn't appear in America, sorry, in France in the late 1950s. And by 1967, when he published his book, it was the most popular activity of people after sleeping and work. Yeah, so it completely taken over people's lives. But it's a jet, obviously the spectacle is a general thing of disempowerment, not, you know, not just television, but radio, advertising, uh, the whole, the, this whole explosion of consumer society. And it's obviously very much influenced by, obviously not just Marx, and you said, probably said earlier on, uh, Lukács. Though I must admit, when I actually did get round to reading Lukács, I, thought, I actually thought he was a red fascist, because the end section where he the party is in control is pretty scary. Um, the, but, but obviously Henri Lefebvre, who, who saw the way that capitalism went from dominating the factory uh, out into dominating everyday life. And a part of the spectacle is a way of thinking about that. So he's using ideas from avant-garde art, but I think what's often overlooked is the heavy influence of council communist theory. People like Panos, Anton Panagook and, Go uh, and Goethe and the KAPD and Paul Matic and all those sorts of people. Um, I'm afraid I have to say that the punk generation in England are partly guilty of that because we wound the film backwards from revolutionary politics in so many ways to avant-garde art. Because you think of the sex pistols they use and the clash and people like that, we're using very much that techniques of uh, provocation and determinants and derive these famous artistic techniques which were developed actually lots of them by the letterists even before the situation is, that we were using those to, as, a, as a way of reinvigorating cultural politics. 
it's interesting that the participatory creativity, which in a way is their key, the key link between their avant-garde art, you know, if you create the carnival, you know, the great thing about the carnival is it can't be recuperated. So they do try quite hard at Notting Hill every year. Uh, because you can, you, know, you can buy off a small group of avant-garde artists and make them famous and give them lots of money, but what you can't do is buy off the whole crowd. You know, because by definition, that's the masses. Um, the many, not the few. Um, so, this, so, so that particular thing, I think it's interesting, because in punk, you can see that and you know, rave culture and you know, grime or so, but it's always the scene where they just pick out a few stars and make them rich, and then basically then the scene becomes uncool and then it has to move on to the next thing. Um, a bit like gentrification, <laughs> I think it's a similar process. Uh, so, in a way, that's, that's been the process. As I said, in a way, the popular, uh, since it's called the idea of the avant-garde, is, and, and we can see here, Leibach is the slogan, people are also very inspired by situationism. Um, uh, and we did, and I said in 2008, we did a, an event in St. Petersburg with Voina, who later, some of whom later became Pussy Riot. Um, again, they're very much using situationist ideas. So that's really the background, is that we, we come out of this English appreciation of situationism, which wasn't successful really in the late 60s, early 70s, though we did create the only situationist terrorist group called the Angry Brigade, briefly. Um, but it was picked up by, um, by suburban press, which were in the early 1970s, a guy called Jamie Reed in Croydon Art College, and people on the periphery of really the first situationist group in England, a couple of people were members of it, um, but they set up a little journal called King Mob, and in their hangers-on fellow travellers was a guy called uh, Malcolm McLaren, and also Bernie Rhodes, who then became the managers of the Sex Pistols and the Platt. We are the next generation, we were influenced by that, and further and younger people. So there was a group of us, we're all, so this is like, as I said, 10 or so years ago, we're very much aware of how the situation has influenced on English culture, it's uh, the way it's been overemphasized in its artistic way. Um, so we were interested because actually if you read Guy Debord's own writings, he says that my most important work is inventing a war game. So we thought this was really interesting, but why would a war game be the most interesting thing they did? And we discovered that the, in the back of Ken Bracken's um, Bio Len Bracken's biography of um, Guy Debord, the rules of the game. So we made up uh, some, uh, uh, the game out of my some toy soldiers I'd recovered from my dad's house. Actually, rather appropriate for here, they were Habsburgs versus Ottomans, yeah, or Christians versus Muslims. Uh, so we started playing the game, and then much to our surprise, it turned out to be a really good game. Um, lefties have actually not had a very good track record producing great ball game. Bertolt Altman, who actually wrote a very good book on Marxist dialectic, wrote this, made this really crap game called Class Struggle, which is appalling. Great idea, but a really awful game. So we started playing it, and then we got interested in it, and started playing it around, so we played it around Europe. We got, as I said, we got invited to Russia to take part in Cyberfest 08. Uh, we then got uh, we then got a, we got some money just before then to build a two and a half size thing of the ball. The original Guy de Ball game, partly because he was doing it in his uh, when he was hiding in the Oberlin from the French secret police after May '68, uh, was a one-on-one -on -one game. So it's like chess or drafts, checkers to Americans. Uh, it, it's um, it's it's one-on-one uh, -on -one game. So what we did is make it two and a half sizes this thing and turn it into a team sport. So originally we started playing it ourselves and then we thought oh, it's much better, it's a situations game, people should do it themselves. So what we'll do later on is divide you into two teams and I'll show you how to play the game. Um, so we made a film, we were given some money by the Arts Council. My favourite part of the whole film that comes out at the end is at the end where it says lottery funded by the Arts Council of England. Um, uh, so, um, it, this is based on Guy Debord's style of filmmaking, it's a, it's a film made out of other films. I co-wrote the script with Fabian Thompson, 
Uh, Fabian is one of the founders of Class War Games. He um, used to be an editor of a sort of libertarian, left communist uh, paper called Class War in the 1980s. It was actually quite a famous um, sort of comic, I guess, political comic, I think. Uh, and that's hence the name, actually. We thought it's a detourment of the name. We thought it'd be quite a funny thing to call it Class War Games. Uh, so we wrote this script. You can download the pamphlet version from the Class War Games episode. But Ilsa, um, uh, who is the director, the best thing she ever did was say, cut the script in half. Less is more. So the script basically goes through two things. Uh, first, it obviously explains the importance of this game for situationist theory. Uh, what it's trying to do is show why Guy Debord was interested in making a game. And the second thing is its relevance to military theory. So, as I said, it's often if you read academic writings about uh, the board game, it's seen as his retirement folly. You know, he had, after May '68, he was threatened that if he stayed in Paris, they would throw him out of a window or something. So he decided to retire to the countryside, and he also dissolved the situation as international, so it didn't turn into a cult and become an ideology. That didn't work very well, did it? <laughs> um, uh, and so it's dismissed as that. So someone like Andrew Hussey uses the game of war as the title of his, of his sort of pop water pop biography of the book. Uh, they don't really take it seriously. But actually, when we started playing the game, then realised that he was he was very much inspired by military theory. He actually wrote ran uh, after '68 and before the assassination of his patron. Uh, Gerard Lepovici, he ran a, a publishing house called Short Libre. So it would publish like ultra left texts, you know, Anton Panikok and people like that, uh, what would become autonomism in Italy. But he also published a lot of military theory. So we were interested, he was not just, it, it's, you know, most lefties are not interested in military theory. We think it's, in fact, we rather revolted by the whole military. He was obsessed by military theory. Uh, Michelle Bernstein told me that she used to buy, who was his first one, told me that she used to buy in toy soldiers for his birthday. She said, boys will be boys. Uh, as, you, as people, oh, she's gone now, well, the little boy will find out soon. Um, but it's also, it's because, uh, so it was partly had a long-standing interest with military, you know, he grew up during the Second World War and its aftermath. Uh, but it's also because, you know, obviously in May 68, they were beaten by a general, General de Gaulle. And so he, his idea was, well, what do you do after May 68? So one of the things, obviously the biggest pressure on the situation is, was to turn themselves into a sect, you know, in a way like a Trotskyist sect or a Maoist sect, and to preserve the ideology, the ideology of running up to May 68 and just afterwards, and freeze it in time. And if you read De Boer's writing, obviously he sees this as the worst possible thing you can do. Uh, he wrote a book with Gianfranco Sanguinetti called The Veritable Split in the International, where he lambasts what they call pro situs people who take their theory and have pride out of time. You know, you've got to take this particular ultra leftist position, which made sense in the late, six, well, mid, say, early 60s to early 70s, and just freeze it. Uh, there's certainly quite a lot of people on the left in England and elsewhere that have, have made a career out of exactly that position. He actually says, no, you've got to actually, obviously, that was their position. He says, we were a small group of people in, you know, in a brief period of time. Is you're going to have to adapt your own politics to the time in which you live in. This is why I can be a situationist and a social democrat at the same time. Uh, uh, but um, I think, so what he wanted to do, so instead of doing instead of free creating an ideology of which he'd be the guru, what he did instead is make this game. So what he wants to do is teach strategy and tactics to lefties. Uh, one of the things that he did here while he was um, basically running Champs Libre is commission a new French translation of Karl von Clausewitz's On War, which is probably one of the greatest books of military theory. Well, he's in ways, the greatest book of military theory ever written. And obviously, it's, you know, Clausewitz uh, used to go and play whist with Hegel. So you can 
so you can see the sort of you know there is obviously some relevance if you're a Hegelian Marxist as to why you'd be particularly interested by Clausewitz's military theory, um, but obviously also other military theorists, uh, as will be explained in the in the film of the game. Um, and so the idea is you would learn strategy and tactics. So the next time round is not by forming a sect and creating an ideology and an ab a vanguard party, actually, and, you know, uh, moving from an avant-garde to a vanguard, but that every, basically every body would train themselves in proletarian bars and bohemian cafes by playing this game so that we'd become a sort of collective general. Actually, Friedrich Engels um, jokingly said that every Frenchman thinks he's a general. Uh, I think this is de Boer's attempt to make it true, actually. Uh, so, in a, so, as I said, you, we can, you know, we can be um, sceptical about how far this is uh, true, true and realisable, but I think it is an interesting way of thinking about it. We've since, uh, we started off by playing this game, and we've been playing a number of games ever since. We've, uh, we worked on a, some games of our own. As I said, last Sunday, we were, we were doing what's called a mega game up in Liverpool. Uh, so the Labour Party, as you're probably aware, has been completely transformed in the last three years since we took it over. Um, one of the interesting things that, that we're trying to do is do like training exercises. We've got lots of new members. So we did this game that's slightly based on, well, it's based on 1980s Labour politics, divide people into factions, tell them they're competing against each other. But actually what the game does is teach them to work together. You have the deep state of the Tory party, the Tory to frighten them into work. So that's a sort of classic of where you're using games for political purposes. And we've, we've done a whole series of other games. We've done everything from H.G. Uh, Wells, who uh, was the inventor of figurine war gaming. We played his little wars. That's a great fun. Particularly kids love it because you get to fire matchsticks at toy soldiers. It was his game to try and stop the Great War, the 1914 war. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. Um, as I said, we tried inventing our own games. We work, and we, we're working particularly now that we've got this cooperative digital liberties. Uh, with as I said, not just propaganda games like uh, Corbyn Run, but actually also trying to use games as a way of encouraging political participation. So that, you know, for instance, if you want to do something like participatory budgeting, which is very democratic, take power out of the hands of the bureaucrats and uh, politicians and give it to first party members and then hopefully the electorate as a whole is the difficulty is you give everyone a spreadsheet their eyes glaze over and you basically create another elite who are the only the people which is a model actually a spreadsheet is itself a model so if you can if you can turn it in, use the ludic tools to actually make it so it's easier for people to make decisions and also this is an analog game someone did do a digital version um, a radical software group but it's essentially an, a, an analog it's to use a combination of digital and uh, analog technology so we see it partly you know as i said this is a training exercise we've done other training exercises games are also this is designed as a social thing you will get to know each other one good way of talking about situationism um, and also as i said i think it's also a, a tool of democracy that games are, are a way in to allow people to participate with each other, other than just meetings. And to, again, to come back to breaking the spectacle. Because the key thing about the spectacle is that people are, it's not just that they're passively watching something, it's that they themselves aren't the creator. And the, as I say, it's the radical message of the situation, even in today's days, you know, posting on Facebook and blogging and setting up your web website it's it is this um it's it's doing it with others you know it's actually coming together collectively and making participatory creativity so one of the things we're trying to do is learning from this game is to make tools that allow the many to rule over the few thank you um, and then we should watch the film can we put this on Please.